afternoon. Um, joining me here on the stage are Nancy Fund, founder and managing partner of DBL Investors, which is a venture capital company that focuses on impact investing. And in this case, DBL stands for Double Bottom Line. Also with me is Ingva Slingsted, CEO of the Norge Bank Investment Management, um, which manages, among other things, the country's nearly $900 billion pension fund. Correct? Welcome. Um, so I'd like to start with, with you, since um, earlier this year, the fund has been starting to divest from coal um, assets. And so I just wanted to ask you to start, if you could tell us how that's going. First of all, how far along you are, and, and what kinds of, um, what are the considerations as you think through getting rid of some investments? What do you bring on in its stead? So, okay, this has been, uh, been a readjustment of the portfolio we've been doing for some years now. Um, so, big picture is that we try to sell out of some of these companies who have large negative externalities um, that we do not like to have in the portfolio, and we invest more in type of companies that have positive externalities. Um, what it meant in practice is that we, uh, in the 2012, started to sell out of some palm oil producers who were cutting down subtropical rainforest. 2013, we went into selling down some of the coal, coal companies, those who are pure producers of coal. What is new now is that we take a harder look at uh, the utility sector, the electricity generating sector, uh, where the new direction is that we're selling out of those electricity producers uh, who in their energy mix do not have a concrete plan to get the coal users below 30% of the total energy mix in their, in their production. So this is something where it's ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing dialogue with the companies and uh, it's uh, not only sort of mapping where we are, but also seeing what kind of investment plans they have, and what kind of risk management they have going forward. Mm -hmm. And so once you do drop something from the fund, how do you think about replacing it? What we have sold out of, kind of those business models where we can think of non-sustainable in the long run, um, is approximately the same si size as our, what we call the environmentally related portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a dedicated portfolio that invests first of all in en environmental technologies, uh, everything from batteries uh, to uh, water cleanage technologies, etc. Mm -hmm. These kinds of companies, I would think, have different risk profiles. So just as, as on a pure investment level, how do you sort of match those risk levels or those perceived risk levels? Well, it's very different types of portfolios, of course. Because it's, it's no real one-to-one -one match between mm -hmm. the two of them. Uh, but as a portfolio as a whole, of course, it gives a much better carbon uh, footprint and it uh, hopefully will give a better return in the long run as well. If you take one step back, you know, we're a fund that, of course, as we mentioned, is large, so approaching 900 billion US dollars. Um, but the more kind of defining characteristic of it is uh, it is really a fund for future generations. Uh, our mission is to safeguard financial wealth for our grandchildren and their grandchildren again. So when we do this, we do this for the profitability for 30, 40, 50 years forward, uh, whether coal companies will be better than um, renewable companies for the next year or two is not really the investment view we're, we're involved in. Okay. So Nancy, you're um, very much on the, a different end of the spectrum here. Um, in some ways, you make some of the riskiest investments, right? You, you're an early stage. Um, so how do you look at your two bottom lines when you analyze companies to invest in? Well, um, first of all, thank you for, for having me. It's great to be at, at this conference at such an important time. So we made a decision from the get-go when we started DBL that it was a no-sacrifice investment approach, and that means we're not going to sacrifice financial return for a social impact. Now, some people do do that, but we don't. We were traditional venture capitalists, and so we really set about to prove that you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. And we actually now, 12 years later, we believe that this, the second bottom line enhances the first bottom line because we've had extraordinary returns with companies like Tesla and SolarCity in our portfolio. Uh, we really uh, have paved the way for some of the massive investments that we're hearing about this week, that you can uh, use innovation, the entrepreneurial economy, uh, 
different business organizations to address climate change and, as the president just said, create, uh, create meaningful careers for folks. And it, is, it isn't just what Tom Friedman said, that you need a middle class that needs you know, clean, cheap energy. These new companies are helping to create the middle class in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And so the social impact is, just goes on and on. So when you're looking, and this is back to you on this, the portfolio, when you're looking at all the different kinds of risks, long-term profitability, that kind of thing, um, do you feel you have all the right tools? Well, you know, when we look at uh, our investment portfolio and think of it in terms of risk, um, it, these issues are really hitting it on three different levels. You know, we have 550 billion US dollars invested in equities. More than 100 uh, billion of that is invested in what you can call the whole energy complex. Mm -hmm. So, of course, these climate risk issues is not only a question for the oil companies, the um, coal producers, but it's the auto industry, it's a chemical industry, of course, building materials, etc. Um, so, we of course have to deal with what is obviously an energy transition that is directly affected those affecting those 100 billion dollars of investing. More generally. We're also um, having what we call a nearly a universal owner status because we own 100, well, we, we own nearly 10,000 companies. Uh, we have a stake in nearly all companies with a market capitalization worth more than 100 uh, million US dollars. Mm -hmm. So, as a or, or one of our main exposure is just you know, the sustainability of the world economy. And the way we're diversifying with basically buying 1% of everything out there. Uh, a key risk aspect for us is just will the world economy develop in a sustainable fashion for us in the long run? Um, that kind of assets, you do not really chair a big one corner of the market or another. You, you diversify and spread yourself out on the whole thing. So in one sense, our portfolio is, reflect, is just a reflection of the whole world economy. So the development in the world economy is probably uh, the one key risk factor on the 30-year mm -hmm. view. Mm -hmm. So Nancy, what about you? Where do you... Where do you see that? The operational risk yeah. uh, methods? Well, if everyone says clean tech venture capital is different from ve regular venture capital. I've been both. They're, they're not that different. I mean, it comes down to analyzing the market. And I mean, there is more of a regulatory risk. You have to jump into policy in this field and, and help to, sh to shape it with your companies. But it really comes down to the team, the, the market size, the, the growth, the differentiation of the technology and, and whether it's scalable and whether the marketplace is is able to be penetrated by new entrants or are the incumbents going to be so fierce that you know even if you have a great product it won't get sold to anyone and i think you see a whole continuum certainly tesla uh, has been a you know tremendously successful company it's already over half the market cap of general motors which has been around for a hundred years uh, but doesn't mean that we haven't had our um, you know uh, fits and starts along the way. There, are, you know, I innovation is messy in, in any sector, and I think the the issue in in this sector is that it's been a hundred years since anything interesting has happened. We're all living with our grandfather's electricity system, so we don't rec recognize that the same kind of innovation that we've seen in phones and radio and computers uh, is happening now in energy, and it's about time because obviously we have critical goals to solve in terms of climate. But the good news is that the entrepreneurial benefits that we've had in, in other fields are, are the same that we're going to experience here, and we already are experiencing. And we are creating the iconic 21st century energy companies to join and in some places replace the, the, 20th, first, the 20th century versions. Mm -hmm. So one thing that um, people in this sort of renewables world say is that um, the venture world has been very fast to catch on and to see that you know this is the future and you know back companies like Solar City or Tesla, but that institutional investors have not yet followed suit. Even though many of these companies have grown, the assets are considered very good. What do you think it's going to take to get institutional investors like yourself um, more engaged in these kinds of companies and in this sector? Well, I think if you uh, look at some of these new companies and the pricing of them, I think uh, it's clear that the market has already uh, put a quite high price on it. So I wouldn't say that the institutional investors are not aware of the changes mm -hmm. that is happening. Um, I don't. Th I think it's more a question of you don't really know which direction this will be going. Um, so again, when we inv invest in environmentally related technologies, we spread it as as, as broadly as possible. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So can you be more specific about that? Well, well you know, uh, we are, for instance, setting out matters to external managers. We have a specific smart grid mandate, whereas mm-hmm. a manager is just doing that. That's mm-hmm. the only investment they have. That's their uh, investment kind of direction. Go out and try to make money on uh, the way the grid is going to be put together. Um, and again, they will be buying 50, 80 companies. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's kind of you know, uh, spread it out and be participating. And as soon as these companies get to scale, of course, they will be priced by the market for their potential future profits. I, I've seen, we've raised, we just raised our third fund, uh, 400 million, which is the largest impact fund in the, in the States. But our first fund was 75 million uh, 12 years ago. So we, we've seen the market evolve. And what was just stunningly different this time was the entrance of family offices, foundations, endowments, driven at least in part by the divest reinvest movement. Um, they, don't call, they don't all call it that, but many of them want to rebalance their portfolios. They want to participate in the 21st century economy as it relates to energy, not the 20th, 20th century. And so there aren't that many um, avenues, uh, but so many more are participating now. We actually had to turn away people. And in our first fund, you, you wouldn't have found anyone that fit that category. So it definitely is changing. So what kinds of investors are you seeing are most interested in coming to the, into this space? So it's, it's, it's a diverse group, just like any uh, venture capital fund, but particular of interest to fam- large uh, high net worths, f- family offices, um, foundations, endowments. Uh, we have some uh, faith-related groups that are that are interested, and then we have the traditional insurance companies, um, banks. We have a few banks and pension funds. Mm-hmm. Okay. So one thing that um, we had talked about earlier that you mentioned was this idea that we don't yet have the sort of the next generation. Um, transformational energy companies, like there is no Google or Apple yet. Um, I'd actually l- like to you both to speak to that. Do you see, I mean, where, where do you think that kind of company might come from? You know, at NRG was setting itself up to be that, and now we don't really know what direction it'll go. Well, and, and, and obviously we're, th- that, that's an issue right now, and I, I think we all really applaud David Crane, the CEO there. That, you know, he really tried and he, he made a difference, but it's really hard to com- to create a revolutionary business under the the roof of a traditional business. I mean, that's why the you know the buggy whip companies didn't move forward. I mean, y- you need new entrants that aren't held back by legacy businesses. And I would argue that we, we have the, uh, the, the big names. Uh, I mean, certainly Elon Musk, I think, is, is as, as famous as, as Apple, you know, getting there. And, and we're, we're building these companies. It hasn't even, you know, it's been a little over 10 years, a little under, under 10 years in the case of Solar City. Uh, so, you know, it, it takes a while for these to, to gestate. But, um, you know, there's a pipeline that's, that's coming along. Uh, Nest, uh, you know, helped to develop the in-home visibility and, and of course now is part of Google. But there's a whole crop of new entrepreneurs out there, many of them coming from the tech world, uh, wanting to uh, make their mark, not just as a fantastic uh, financial success, but to do something that really matters. So I think, I don't think we're, have, we're going to have any shortage and I, and I would argue that we've, we've already started in terms of building the big names uh, for 21st century economy. Mm-hmm. Where do you see that coming? Well, it would of course be great if you can uh, come up with a company and uh, identify it early that would change the world and be the next Google or Apple in its space. Uh, the way we're approaching it, uh, as I said, we try to diversify it as much as possible. But not only that, I think you have to play both the long-term kind of revolutionary technology type companies, but also the more mundane kind of medium-term energy efficiency, uh, where the gains are obvious and quite large and probably, in the big scheme of things, probably more of an impact. And that can be getting to market and changing the way we do business and the way we consume energy and, uh, in a quite rapid and, and very impactful way. Mm-hmm. But energy efficiency is not necessary. I mean, it's not the first thing investors think about. I think it's been complicated for a lot of people to wrap their heads around how to make money off of it. Are you mm-hmm. seeing that change? I, I think it is. You know, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, the smart grid and things like that coming in. 
Uh, I think also when you, in the last panel session here, kind of, you know, focusing on how to get rid of subsidies instead of getting up to the, with the carbon pricing scheme that everybody will subscribe to, you know, we have to take the easy wins in the medium term if you can get them, and then of course continue to work full, term, full time for the very long term wins as well. I think you see that in the energy complex also. If you, if you look at the world today, you have roughly one third of the energy consumption is oil, another third is coal. Uh, then you have 20% on, on, uh, on uh, the gas and nine on alternatives and maybe four on, on nuclear. Mm -hmm. So the whole game there is kind of how do you kind of replace the coal with some of the others? And maybe you have to actually replace quite a bit of the coal with gas first. And you should be willing to take that gain as well. And then you can work for the longer game for the, for the alternative energy mm -hmm. at the same time. But I think it's very important as investors that, and also as policymakers that we just recognize that we have to play all time horizons here. Hmm. Just, I was thinking about your comment about the, the next Googles and um, just, it's all relative, isn't it? Because we just made it our first investment in Africa in a company called Off Grid Electric, which is bringing a uh, little solar and little ion lithium battery to, to Tanzanian roofs in a, in a energy efficient light so that they don't have to use kerosene lamps, which are obviously not healthy, and they don't have to walk miles to charge their cell phones. And this is all, they can get all of this, pay as you go, pay with your cell phone, um, and less than what you pay for kerosene right now. So it's kind of like, what's not to like about that? And in fact, uh, installing at the rate of 10,000 uh, rooftops a month. I mean, just an incredibly scalable, massively scalable opportunity. And in terms of the Google comparison, uh, there's no workforce ready to do this, um, trained and ready, uh, just as there wasn't in the early days of solar in the U.S. So the company has created an academy, and they, they get a lot of the graduates from the, the university in Tanzania, and then they, get, uh, they come to be trained, and then they go out and they, they work for the company, and there are 800 employees. In this area of Africa, there's only 4% of the population that is middle class, so you know, a huge drag uh, in terms of uh, economic development and quality of life. And so what they're saying about this company, 800 employees is, is kind of a lot for a three-year-old company in Tanzania, is that it's, everyone wants to work there now. It's becoming the Google of Tanzania. Mm. So these are the kinds of companies that will transform uh, whole regions as well as lives within the next decade. Great. So I think we'll take some questions from the audience. You can email us at q at nytimes.com, and I'll take some questions first over here if we have any. OK. Um, I have two questions that I think follow on what was said. One is, do you agree with what Al Gore said at the start of COP21, that investors should move their assets from fossil fuels to renewables or risk stranded assets? and then. Following on that, how can ESG screening be mainstreamed in the investment community? Well, I certainly agree with Al Gore. I mean, he's a colleague of Generation Investment Management, is, is, uh, while does more public stocks than and we do private, does the similar kinds of investing. And as I said, uh, w we wouldn't be at 400 million if people didn't believe that it was time to let go of, of fossil fuels as the engine of of, of growth uh, in terms of um, the economy and, and, and energy use. So, and there are so many more alternatives and uh, you don't want to, the last thing you want to do is miss an innovation cycle if you're an investor, if you're a CIO at a university, if you held on to mainframes and mini computers when Apple came on the scene, you probably didn't keep your job that long. So it's, it's time to move on, that's what I would say. You want to answer the question about ESG? Yeah, Three. well, I can take uh, take a shot at that, but uh, but first, you know, selling out to all uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, yeah, I I think kind of philosophically, we believe more in uh, in playing all uh, all companies that's there, including uh, including the incumbents, uh, and uh, get there to change their business practices. A lot of what we're doing is uh, creating expectations, formalizing them, and uh, writing it down and sending it to the companies on how they should change the way they're doing business. Uh, so we have a specific expectation document for climate change risk for all companies, including the oil majors and others, which goes to both addressing their investment plans, uh, how they're dealing with climate risk in their concrete practices, and how reporting on emissions and other key variables, uh, the data that we need as investors. Uh, so I think, you know, kind of sort of just, well, let's just leave that and invest in something else is not necessarily the best answer. Uh, it's rather working with, uh, with all the companies out there. 
And I think the same thing goes with the ESG. You know, we are working consciously on the whole area of all the companies that we are investing in and trying to be uh, standard setters or participating to be standard set, participating in research and participating in, in kind of the dialogue to improve the business practices. Uh, rather than to sort of say, we'll not invest in this, but only in this, etc. I think that's more fruitful and it's probably uh, more impactful also in, in the final end. So rather than own, not own, we have to go there and engage with the companies and do active ownership. Okay, I think we can take one, at least from the floor, if there are any. Yes, you, sir. Thank you. Um, one of the things we are discussing at another session yesterday was um, in order to mainstream more of this type of investment, the absence of um, homogeneous metrics for assessing the impact of some of these investments, like in the African case. I was wondering if for your clients that's uh, something that they ask and if there's a, a solution for that or a, or a magic bullet for, for finding the balance between how much uh, measurement of impact you do and how much it's just about you believe it's the right thing and you just do it. It, it's a great question and, and it really um, is at the, the basis of impact investing is, is the role of metrics because obviously if you don't measure, you don't really pay attention. Uh, and so we, we are in the camp and, and, and it's worked for us um, that metrics are, are very important. We, our first investor was the Ford Foundation uh, as an as a impact investment and they had a bunch, they had job creation metrics. And uh, we had sustainability metrics, so we worked together. Uh, at first, they wanted us to measure so much that you know, no entrepreneur would come near us, you know, uh, because their young companies are fragile enough, as is, to have us have our questionnaire wanting all these, this information. So we came to a balance, and now we have 12 years of data. We're actually uh, working on some uh, business school case studies with, with, our, with our metrics. Uh, but the, the good news is that it really does give you information that's powerful. It, it, I mean, that, that quote about the solar industry being bigger than the coal industry, uh, we have the data to show that. We actually sh have shown that we've created over 50,000 jobs just within our portfolio. And uh, in any, any industry, jobs have political power. And so jobs is, is one of the tools to get sustainability to have more political capital because no politician wants to do anything that will reduce jobs. So the, the metrics, you know, you have to th uh, think about them. They need to last. You can't change them midstream. But they can be enormous, uh, enormously powerful in helping your companies gain um, the hearts and minds of, of the population. All right. Yeah, I, um, if I may, I'd like to kind of generalize your question because um, what I really see here is that uh, in, in sessions like this and others, uh, um, there's a question of kind of how do we go from words to action because we seem to be kind of agreeing on the analytics now, so what do we do? Um, for us as an investor, I think it's a very simple step in between here. For us, it's kind of how do you go, go from words to numbers? Uh, and that goes bo both when we go to other companies and talk about their investment plans, but more specifically when we talk about the reporting. Do we really have good numbers here? And we tried to come up with for the first time last year, uh, our combined carbon footprint of our investment portfolio. We just find out that you know, the data quality just simply isn't good enough. So I think if you go here and say, okay, we really want the numbers, we really want the data, uh, then you start to measure. When you start to measure, you get more insightful knowledge that you can actually use to change some practices. So I think the first thing for the whole investment community is to sort of go to the companies and have the companies produce those data and then you can start to, start to work on it. And that's extraordinarily important when you have a risk like this. And then we kind of need to have the, the, the data to do the risk management. Right. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you both for joining me today. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Keith Bradford. Come, come.